Last video we saw how to represent and do math with vectors graphically. And now we're going to segue over to how to do it with components. And the bridge between these two is our special vectors known as unit vectors. Now a unit vector is literally that, a vector of length one. Now, in physics, we're always very careful to say one what, how many, you know, what, what uh, physical units do you have associated with that? And the answer here is there are no units. This is just basically the number one given a direction. And you can make these things point anywhere you want, but, in, uh, but for what we want right now, there are three special ones that point along the x, y, and z coordinate axes. And so these um, get called i hat, j hat, and k hat. And these are vectors of length 1 that point in the x, y, and z directions um, accordingly. Now you might ask, why don't you call them x hat, y hat, and z hat? And in fact, some people do. Um, this is more for legacy reasons um, because it used to be that in order to represent uh, positions in 3D, um, before the vectors were invented, um, mathematicians and physicists used an extension of complex numbers called uh, quaternions. And so just like i is the square root of negative 1, in this extension, j and k were also equal to the square root of negative 1, but not equal to each other, but the product of them was. And those details don't really matter, but suffice it to say that the i, j, and k is a holdover from the days when, um, when, vec when what we would now use vectors were represented using this extension of the complex numbers known as quaternions. And you'll notice that although these are vectors, I didn't write the little half arrow vector signy thingy. Instead, I wrote a circumflex, which usually you just read as hat because it looks kind of like a little hat. Um, and this is a special notation for unit vectors. So these are vectors of length one with no physical dimension. length one, no physical dimension. And um, in this series of videos, we're not going to stress too much about k hat, which points in the z direction, because most of the time we can keep our motion confined to a plane. And so we'll be mostly interested in the x and y directions. So i hat and j hat are going to be the ones that uh, we're most interested in. And <clears throat> the idea with these unit vectors is that we can construct any vector we want by taking these unit vectors and applying the rules of uh, scalar multiplication. Um, we multiply these unit vectors by whatever scalar quantities we want and then we can add that together to construct any vector we want. So let's say that um, I have a velocity um, like so, and we'll say that its magnitude is 5 meters per second. I'm choosing that one very specifically. Um, let's say this is angled 37 degrees above the x-axis. Um, I can construct this by first taking my vector i hat, which points to the right or, or points east, and multiply it by 4 meters per second, like so. So this vector here is i hat, a thing that points right that I've times by four meters per second. So I've given it its physical dimension now when I've multiplied it by my scalar quantity. Now I can add to it, and here I'll do it by tail to head. 
um, a vector j hat, uh, sorry, three, three meters per second times my vector j hat. So j hat points up or north. Um, I multiplied this by three meters per second. And if I want to point south, I would multiply by negative three meters per second. In any event, I can now write my velocity vector um, as four meters per second times i hat plus three meters per second times j hat. And for completeness sake, if you want, we can say plus zero meters per second k hat, but I'm not too worried about that. All right. With this, um, we can start to segue into component vectors, which are not the same thing as vector components, but we will tie these together very quickly. Um, so we sort of um, already introduced the idea without necessarily realizing it um, by constructing a quantity out of unit vectors. So let's say this is my vector a, like so. Um, I can, following the same sort of idea, and here I'll use the parallelogram rule, I can imagine constructing my vector a by adding this special vector that points purely in the x direction and this special vector that points purely in the y direction. This is a sub x and a sub y with vectors on them. And you can see I can complete the parallelogram to make my vector a. So I can say that a x plus a y equals my vector a. All right, and again, just as a reminder, the magnitude of my vector a, we would just write as a, and this is always a positive um, number because the magnitude just means the length of the vector. So these uh, vectors here go by a special name of component vectors. As in, these are the components you need to add this up. Now, this is not the same thing as the, sim as the related and confusingly named concept vector components, which you'll use much more. Component vectors are sort of a bridge to that. So the idea here is I, if we go back from before, since I can get any vector by timesing it by timesing a scalar by i hat, j hat, or k hat, I can get any component vector doing that. i hat points along x, so I can make any ax equal to some number times i hat. Similarly, any ay is some number times j hat. So this this number that you need is the vector component and you just write it as ax or ay without the vector sign. So ax, ay are what you need to multiply Oops, let's make that look a little better. Multiply i hat and j hat by to get ax and ay, the vectors. So we call these the x and y components of the vector a. And a lot of times you just skip through the whole component vector thing and just diagram in the components directly. So say this is my vector a, um, I would just 
say, drop down a horizontal and a vertical like this. And I would just write AX and AY like that. And we would say that this is the X component of A. And this is the Y component of A. And importantly here, these quantities here, um, this can be positive or negative. Um, if it's positive, it's pointing to the right or east or whatever. And negative would be left or west or whatever. And similarly, this could be positive or negative. This would be up or down or north and south. Um, so even though we write this like it was the magnitude of AX and AY, that isn't quite right. It's the number you need to multiply I hat or J hat by to get the component vector. Confuse, the notation is maybe just a shade confusing, but you get used to it pretty quickly. All right, so let's say you have the magnitude and direction of a vector and you want to find the components. How would you do that? Um, you do trig. So just as a quick example here, let's say this is my vector B. I'm going to have it point down into the right like that. And we'll say that this angle theta here is 37 degrees again. Why 37 degrees? Um, technically it's 36.9, but uh, 30, 37 degrees and 53 degrees are the interior angles of a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. So that way I can do the trig in my head. So let's say I want to find the x and y components of my vector b. Again, I can just imagine extending out the legs of the right triangle here. So this would be bx, this would be by. And the idea here, and let's say my vector b is 10 meters long. Um, so the idea here is I just use um, trig, so we'll just uh, go with a good old Sokotoa. If you haven't seen this mnemonic before, this is just a way to remember how sine, cosine, and tangent work. So the sine of theta, that's the S, is the opposite over the hypotenuse. C for cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. The T in TOA is for tangent theta, and that's opposite over adjacent O over A. And you'll have to put in your plus and minus signs uh, by hand. But let's go ahead and first and think about trying to find BX. So I know the hypotenuse, I want the adjacent. So that's going to be cosine here. So we can say cosine theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Oops. So that's bx over b. So bx is equal to b cosine theta. So that's 10 meters times the cosine of 37 degrees is plus 8 meters. And the reason it's plus 8 is because the vector b is pointing in a right-ish direction. All right, now what if I want, so now let's go ahead and find uh, by. Um, now here I'll have to put in a minus sign by hand, but we can play the same game. This is the opposite, so we can say that the sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Um, so this would be b y over b, and I'll stick in a minus sign here because I know that um, b y should be a negative number. But when we do trig in physics, we usually try to rig it up so that all of our angles are between zero and ninety degrees. So mathematically, they're in quadrant one, even though. Uh, 
our vector b here clearly points into quadrant four. Um, the reason that we like mathematically making everything quadrant one is because of how calculators work. While the regular trig functions are just fine, inverse trig functions in particular um, have to make choices about what quadrant um, the answer is in. And different calculator manufacturers make different choices about what quadrant things point in. So the only quadrant that you can trust for sure in a calculator is quadrant one. So physicists like to make all of their angles to be between zero and 90 degrees just to keep everything in quadrant one in your calculator, which means that we have to take care of the plus and minus signs ourselves. Since we know this is really pointing in quadrant four and by should be negative, that's why I had to put the minus sign there because I'm mathematically forcing my theta into quadrant one. So by here will be equal to minus b sine theta. So this will be minus 10 meters sine of 37 degrees will be negative 6 meters. And I interpret the minus sign as meaning we're going down. OK, well, let's do the reverse example. Um, so let me just copy paste this real quick. Copy. Oops. Paste. There we go. So let's say we already knew our vector components, but we wanted to find the magnitude and the direction. So we'll use the exact same values we had from before. So we know what the answer is going to be, but let's just work it through. So let's say BX is eight meters, BY is negative six meters. Um, I want to know what is the magnitude of B and what is this ang direction angle here. So I can get the magnitude here by the Pythagorean theorem. So B squared since that's hypotenuse, will be equal to bx squared plus by squared, since these are the legs of a right triangle. I can take the square root of both sides, get that b is the square root of bx squared plus by squared, like that. So b will be the square root of 8 meters squared, quantity squared, plus negative 6 meters quantity squared, all right, so when I square things, the minus sign goes away. Both the number and the unit get squared, which is good, because this is going to give me like 64 square meters here. This will give me 36 square meters here for a total of 100 square meters. Now, the important thing is when I take the square root, I have to take the square root of both the 100 and the square meters. So it'll leave me with 10 as the square root of 100, but then the square root of square meters is just meters. All right, so we got that the magnitude is 10 meters. Now, the way we get the direction is via the arctangent trick. So we can start by saying that the tangent of theta is the opposite over the adjacent. Ooh, let's try that again. Opposite over... adjacent. There we go. Um, and again, remember, this is really living in quadrant four, but mathematically we want to force everything into quadrant one to make sure that our calculators love us. So we're just going to solve for this, and then at the end I'll show you how we indicate what quadrant we're in. So I need to force um, this to be the opposite to be a positive number, and I know it's negative. So I'm going to say minus by bx is positive, so it doesn't need any forcing. All right, now I'll take the arctangent of both sides. So on the left, the arctangent of the tangent theta is just theta itself. And on the right now, we have the arctangent of minus by over bx. And again, what we're doing here is we are mathematically forcing this into quadrant one to make our calculator like us. 
So this is going to give me the arc tangent of minus a minus six meters over eight meters. Now let's look at a couple things here first. First off, I have minus and minus is a plus. That's good. So now I'll be taking the arc tangent of a positive number. And you see this is the thing is that arc tangent of a positive number could return a uh, an angle in either quadrant one or in quadrant three. Your calculator doesn't know which. So calculator manufacturers have to just assume a quadrant. And they, they do all assume quadrant one. Um, there are similar issues with arc sine and arc cosine, and calculator manufacturers do not consistently make um, they do not make consistent choices of quadrants for negative inputs into arc sine, arc cosine, or even arc tangent. This is why we force everything into quadrant one. Second thing is notice that the meters here cancel, and this is super important. Whenever you are taking an, an inverse trigonometric function, it has to be dimensionless. I don't know what an arc tangent of meter means. So any physical units you have going into an inverse trig function always need to cancel. If they don't, that means you made some sort of a math mistake somewhere. All right, punch all that through your calculator, you get 37 degrees. Well, that's awesome but 37 degrees where. <clears throat> so by convention, what we'll do is we'll say, if this direction is east, B is heading south of east. And so we would finish this off by saying 37 degrees south of east, like that. We could also say that it is 53 degrees east of south. That is a perfectly valid description. Alrighty. So the, this now will lead us into doing vector arithmetic using components. So the idea goes like this. We know that we can construct any vector by adding up its component vectors, and we can construct any component vector by taking unit vectors and multiplying them by the appropriate scalars. So the, what mathematicians realized is that we don't even really need to draw the arrows anymore. So let's say I'm adding two displacements. We'll make my first displacement um, negative two comma one meters. Now, what this means is that this, this vector is the same difference as adding um, negative two meters times i hat plus one meter times j hat. But here, I'm not even bothering to actually write the i hats and j hats anymore. Um, so I'm just writing a list of numbers. And mathematicians have shown that you can represent a vector purely as a list of numbers. And that's really cool. All right, let's uh, go ahead and pick a second displacement. So this is four comma three meters. And again, same idea. Um, that's the same difference as writing 4 meters times i hat plus 3 meters times j hat. Alrighty. Now, <clears throat> a quick word about notation. You'll notice that I wrote the displacement as delta r. In previous videos, I wrote things like delta x and delta y. What's up with that? And that's because of a unique, annoying bit of physics notation having to do specifically with positions and displacements. The name of the position vector in physics is r, with a little arrow over it. And since the displacement's a change in position, the name of a displacement is delta r. 
Now the names of the components you would think would be r sub x and r sub y, but we write those so often that we just write x and y. So that if motion is purely along the x direction, that's why we wrote delta x, is that it's technically delta r sub x, but we never bother actually um, writing out the subscript. And this is a thing we do specifically for the vector r, our position vector, and delta r, um, our displacement vector. For anything else, like a velocity, the name of the velocity vector is v, its x component is v sub x, its y component is v sub y, acceleration is a, its x component is a sub x, its y component is a sub y. But we don't write r sub x and r sub y. If you do, people would probably know what you're doing, but nobody writes it that way. So anyway, let's say that our total, our journey was made of two different um, uh, phases. So we want to know the displacement for the whole journey, delta r. I can do that by adding up the two displacements. Because after all, we don't care about the path. We just care about how we ended up. And so here's the trick is what you can do is you can just add these slot wise so you say negative two comma one meters like that plus four comma three meters like that so you just go ahead i'm oh, sorry negative yeah negative four comma three so you just go ahead and you add the x components together so negative two plus four is plus two and one plus three is four. So our net displacement is two meters east and four meters north. And that makes sense. If we take a look at this, um, we were saying we went first two meters to the left, and then we ultimately ended up four meters to the right of where we started from. So up to, sorry, four meters to the right of that. So we ended up two meters to the right of where we started from. And we went one meter north and three meters north to end up a grand total of four meters north of where we started from. So, cool. So we can just write the numbers and add them up in slots. And vector subtraction works the same kind of way. Let's say I have an initial and a final position so we'll say my initial position is three comma two meters and my final position is four comma six meters. I can do the subtraction slot wise as well. So my delta R would be R final minus R initial because remember changes are always final minus initial. So I just go ahead and arrange it in slots like this and subtract each slot individually. 4 minus 3 is 1, 6 minus 2 is 4. So I have my displacement vector is 1 comma 4 meters. So that means that the position 4 comma 6 is 1 meter to the right and 4 meters above my initial position. And again, this doesn't tell me anything about the actual path I took to get there. It just <coughs> says how I ended up. All right, so how do I go ahead and do something like a multiplication by a scalar? Um, so let's just, as an example here, oops, let's say I have a velocity. Um, so this is negative seven comma nine meters per second. So this piece would be my V sub X and this piece would be my V sub Y. And let's say I say that something is going twice as fast as that. So what is its velocity? Um, the idea of something like this is you distribute the scalar across the vector components. So 2 times negative 7 will be negative 14. 2 times 9 will be 18 meters per second, like that. 
All right, and because I didn't really know where else to stick it, one final little bit of notation. Um, some physicists are not terribly hung up about X and Y being horizontal and vertical. They'll be whatever is convenient for a problem. So a lot of problems will be seen in the not too distant future will involve things like say a crate sliding down a, a ramp or something like that. With these so-called inclined plane problems, um, it is almost always the case that you want to choose a coordinate system that is, where the x-axis is parallel to the inclined plane like that. So this would be my x and my y coordinate like that. Um, we'll get in. Um, and this is because the, the object will be accelerating down the ramp. It'll be mathematically convenient to make the acceleration point in just one axis. But that's a coming attraction. But let's say that we've got a vector A in our coordinate system here. If I take the components of it, um, again, it's the same deal, but now you got to be really careful. Like to get my AX here. What I'm doing is I'm dropping a perpendicular down to the x-axis like that, and this will be my ax right there. And similarly, to get a sub y, I need to drop a perpendicular over to my y-axis, and this piece right here will be my a sub y. There, let's make those look the same. Now for this kind of a thing, a lot of times when direct, there's a natural thing that you're trying to align axes to be parallel or perpendicular to, instead of writing this as a sub x, a lot of times we'll write this as a parallel. And instead of writing this as a sub y, we will write this as a perpendicular. Alrighty, so in the uh, Next set of videos, we will be taking this idea and expanding it out to doing uh, kinematics in more than one dimension. So we will catch you over there.